Hey folks, Rich here, South Florida Beekeeping with Rich. So last Thursday night, uh, October the 12th, I did a presentation in front of the Happy Hoofers. That's the local chapter of the Florida Trail Association, a volunteer group that helps to maintain, along with a lot of other organizations across the state, they help to maintain the 1,500 plus miles of nature trails that we have available for hiking across the state of Florida. They cut back vegetation, they mow other areas, they do maintenance on walkways. Uh, they spend a lot of time volunteering out there in the woods, sweating in the summers, and uh, doing maintenance so that everybody else can enjoy the trails. And they asked me to come do a presentation on bees. I went and gave them one last Thursday night and they gave us permission to go ahead and post it here. So enjoy this on our tra on our channel. Go. So we're going to start out here with a little story. Okay, a few years ago, my wife and I uh, scheduled an entire week at John Pennekamp State Park. We wanted to do the whole nine yards. We, uh, you know, went out on a glass bottom boat ride. We uh, snorkeled off the reef in a charter boat. We kayaked among the uh, mangroves. We walked all the trails in there. And other days we were exploring every brown sign we found anywhere within 50 miles of the area, basically. And one of the places that we really enjoyed was literally just one mile up the road from uh, Pentacamp. Hold the whole name of it. Hang on here a second. It's the uh, Dagny Johnson Key Largo Hammock Botanical State Park. Is the whole lot? That's a mouthful, isn't it? It's it's uh, Dagny Johnson is what people up there call it. It was going to be a development, but they ran out of money, and the county was able to grab it, and then the state got it from them. So you go into the entrance, you park. You walk down a main road and that tees and you go down and you have really wonderful, huge loops, lovely trails, uh, all kinds of different biomes and such there. But the funny part of this story, the reason I'm telling it is we've gone from the entrance, we're walking down towards the tee where everything starts and there are six German tourists and they are double timing it out of there. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, they must have be scheduled to be somewhere else at 10 o'clock. And there's like, go back, go back. There's bees, there's bees, there's bees everywhere. And we went, really? Cool. Which way? That way? And we start going. And the woman says, don't you understand there's bees? And my wife turns around and says, it's okay, we're beekeepers. And I'll never hear this woman says, oh, that's okay then. <laughs> now, we didn't make it in time. One of the most magical things is to be in the middle of a swarm of bees when bees are splitting their colony and looking for a new home and you have got roughly six or 7,000 bees, each bee occupying about one cubic foot and it's just everywhere. It's just the most wonderful thing. You can walk through the middle of them. They are totally gentle and there's nothing to fear. The most Africanized bee in the world can't be bothered with a human being when they're on a mission like that. Now, we unfortunately didn't get there in time because that whole process takes less than 20 minutes. Uh, but we did find them. We did find the uh, gumbo limbo that uh, they were bivouacking at. The bees will leave their home base. They will bivouac somewhere. And then from there, they will look around, find a new place to live, and they'll move into their permanent quarters. Uh, so. That was fun, and it was just, those tourists were just taken off from there. You don't need to fear bees all that much. Is there anybody here who actually is really scared of bees? Excellent, good. Because there's some bees here, so <laughs> we'll just uh, <laughs> let them go from that. Yeah, okay, <laughs> at least as long as they're in there. So, but if you're down in that area, I mean, wow, there are so many, like those little brown signs we found areas where there were trails running through three different biomes, and those three biomes were separated by one foot of elevation each. And the plants, the vegetation at this level, you simply didn't find it one foot higher. And the stuff there, you didn't find one foot higher. But some of that stuff was so incredibly attractive to the bees. 
you could hear them 30, 40 feet away. And you get up there and they're just absolutely covered with them. And even though we were sticking our heads in the middle of it, still they were paying us no mind because the bees are just out there uh, doing their thing and harvesting their nectar. They have no interest in you. The only way you're going to get stung is if you in some way interfere with them. Uh, we have a huge hedge of fire bush at a home somewhere near us. And my wife was walking by it one day and she didn't gain, she didn't give way enough. She brushed up against some of the flowers where the bees were and she did get popped one day. But you know, that's her fault. That's, <laughs> <laughs> she should have walked around that a little bit more, given her more space. But, <laughs> but it's, I, I've just never gotten over that one foot of elevation difference. I've been in Northern Japan, hiking their national forest in the mountains where every 200 feet you have a different variety of red maple. And I mean, near the twain shall meet. You're here and the maple's got this huge leaf like this. 200 feet up, you've got this little bitty tiny leaf that looks more like a spider than anything else. 200 feet up from there, you've got something entirely different. 200 feet up from there, something entirely different. And they just, they bloom at different times, so they don't do anything. Bees sometimes are the same way. There's a lot of South American meliponas. Uh, it's a stingless bee that are the same way. You, we, we're never going to be using them because they live in a 2,000 foot elevation range. This one lives at this 2,000 foot. This one lives at this 2,000 foot. This one lives at this 2,000 foot range. Take them out of that range, they die. But as long as you, you can move them from mountain to mountain, as long as you keep them in that range, they're fine. But they just, they're that adapted. Whereas our Western, our, our European honeybee is a generalist. You can put them anywhere, a tire, a composter, an old bucket, flower pot, they'll make it home. Neighbor, neighbor soffits a lot of times, yeah, that's unfortunate too. Uh, but what I want to talk about first is some things that will be useful to you as people who are out there in the woods, both walking around and working and such. So we're going to get into some of that, and it's going to kind of wander around a little bit. If you were to look for the literature, you're going to be told that in nature, bees like to arrange themselves about one half mile apart as a grid. Okay, this is, this is all based on work that was done at the Arno Research Forest in New York State at Cornell University. They've gone in and they've, 20 years apart, sampled this forest and they always find the same thing. The bees are about a half mile apart on grid there. I know it doesn't work that way down here because I can show you houses, abandoned houses that have a beehive on each one of the four sides. Totally separate. They have no problem being that close together. Uh, up until that strong wind two weeks ago that just suddenly gusted through here after that, you know, the hurricane that was out in the Gulf, there was a tree at a park out in Southwest Ranches, a dead, or not dead, it was actually a living, vigorous palm tree, green head on it, that had three separate colonies exiting through three different woodpecker holes in the trunk. And it was like, this thing's got to be totally rotten inside, but it's still got a green top on it. Uh, but a couple of weeks ago, it came over and all those hives with it. Uh, our bees down here don't mind being in much closer quarters than that. Now is what beekeepers do with bees, keeping them four on a pallet and 200 in a hive, and that hive is you know, that are 200 in a uh, out, out apiary. No, nah, that's not great. But our bees down here do, are a whole lot closer together. So when you're out there in the woods, if you're quiet and you listen, you might hear the hum of bees. Now, if the bees are 15 feet up in the air, you and they will probably never interact. And where you will interact sometimes is the truly Africanized bees will accept a very small cavity and they will accept being in the ground between the roots of trees between buttonwood trees with their strongly ribbed bases they'll get in there i've had to do removals from the base of buttonwood trees uh ficus trees forget about it 
I mean, I think you could probably have 10 separate hives and one great big old banyan tree and who knows, but they will sometimes, the, particularly the truly Africanized ones will take much smaller cavities and they will be much closer to the ground. I don't know that that's their own, you know, they're going to do it because it's their only option, but I've seen them in places where this one's in the ground right here. And if you'll just look right over there, there's a huge nest that's in on a branch of a ficus tree. And that's the other thing. This is South Florida. And by that, I don't just mean here in the eastern part. The Everglades and all that is also South Florida. The bees down here survive the winter in the open. We have lots and lots and lots of open air hives. Now, those hives oftentimes are not terribly long lived, but by long lived, they kind of a three year cycle. And they oftentimes don't make that. I'm gonna give you an example here. About three weeks ago, I was asked to come do a removal of a beehive in a tree out at the Sawgrass Mall. And this particular hive was towards the end of a branch that had, had been trimmed back several times, so it was kind of uh, witch's broom type material on it. And they had done a really great job of weaving their uh, comb in and out through there, and they were nice and solid. But uh, the uh, manager out there said, yeah, somebody said they got chased by a bee last week. And I said, hmm, yeah, but probably not those. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, because this one's intact, look at this one. And he's looking over here, but literally from that beam right there to right there, there is another beehive in the tree directly across. Only this one had made its hive from a really substantial solid branch. It wasn't out towards the end where it could sway some with the wind. It was on a really solid branch, and that same gust of wind I was mentioning a moment ago had apparently hit that broadside in the middle of the day when it was sunny and hot out and snapped all the comb off, and it all fell to the ground. And the bees, the queen, she got back up there, and they were busy rebuilding up here. But there was this pile of comb on the ground, so obviously the mowers hadn't been through yet, this happened after the last time they'd mowed the area, which they do very regularly. But here it is all pancaked on the ground. Not, and you know what? I took it home because I'm going to salvage the wax out of it, of course. And yeah, there's dead brood in it, but there was no real amount of dead bees in there. Most of them were able to crawl out. And I mean, it was pancaked. This whole thing was together. It all snapped as a unit, came down, and they were just up there busily rebuilding. Nice and solid as anything. Other times I've been out and gotten a call and gone out to the place and there, the woman says, I swear there were chunks of honeycomb on the ground here last night from that hive up there. And she's pointing to a live oak tree with a branch that's swaying and the wind had come through and knocked some pieces off. I said, yeah, but that was yesterday. Overnight, the possums and everything came and ate it all up. You know, <laughs> it's like they don't, they're not going to waste a good thing. Larvae is high protein food source for them they're not going to waste any of that so but she's like the thing is the week before a big piece of that fell off and it landed on my kids slide what happens if my kids had been there it's like that would have been bad and you know <laughs> i cited the owner of the tree to remove that hive up in there i wasn't a beekeeper at that time i was just a code enforcement officer yes boo <clears throat> boo yes i know okay <laughs> yeah Prodigiously. Prodigiously. Yes, Africanized bees, particularly in South Florida, are wonderful honey producers. Now, let's get into some, uh, some specifics here. Number one, RAID is not a good thing to use on beehives. RAID is designed for the systems of wasp and hornets. Unless you actually hit it straight on enough to knock them out of the air, you're probably not going to kill bees with raid. I've been out to trees they were trying to get the bees out of so they could cut the tree down, and there'll be like eight cans of raid on the ground, and the bees are totally unperturbed by it. It's like didn't do any good at all. Raid is not really designed for them. All you can do is poison the comb and the honey 
So when they take the honey back, they end up putting more poisons into their comb at home, and that just leads to the collapse of whatever bees robbed that place out. But that's not a topic we're really going to get into. Just braid doesn't work with bees. You're better off with smoke or something. Uh, vitamin C. If you guys are going to be out in the wild, be sure to take some extra vitamin C because vitamin C does a wonderful job of neutralizing molitin, which is the active uh, poison in the sting of a bee. I mean, if I have not been taking my vitamin C every day and I get popped, I could have a mark like a quarter. But if I take my vitamin C once a day and I get popped, I wouldn't even be able to tell you where it was five minutes later. Vitamin C, really a good thing to have in your system if you're going to be out there in the woods. I don't know if it works for mosquitoes or anything else. Can't, couldn't tell you. But vitamin C is a great way to neutralize molitin. Now, on the other hand, if you guys are getting cortisone shots, then you probably shouldn't be taking vitamin C. And I don't even know if your doctors know that because molitin causes a cortisol response in the body. You wonder why bee sting therapy is useful? It's because you get stung by a bee, the molitin causes your body to make a natural cortisol re reaction, a response at the site of the sting. And it's like, oh, okay, that's great. But I'm kind of suspecting that, you know, cortisone that's in the shot, if you're taking vitamin C, and they might kind of battle with each other. I don't know, and I haven't looked up any information on that. It's just kind of thinking about it. Uh, the most, yeah, the most, the best thing you can do if you do get stung by a bee is, whether it be a knife or a credit card or whatever, scrape the stinger out immediately. Do not. I was like, it's just sticking up there like that. I'll just grab it like this and pull it. You'll do that once. You won't do it twice. Because there is a sack of venom at the end of that stinger. And if you do this, you just gave yourself a big stick. Because venom can be pumped into you for up to 10 minutes. It doesn't pump, pump, pump really powerfully. So you've got some time. You can get out a knife or a credit card or something, or if you've got really long fingernails. So I'm kind of figuring if you guys are out there doing the kind of work you do in the woods, you probably don't have long fingernails. So just scrape it off. That's the first thing you do. Now, on to the second thing you do. Oh, there we go. Uh, Let me organize my thoughts here just a second. I want to talk, I want to, talk to you about uh, isobutyl acetate, but I want to make sure I get my thoughts in line here. Yeah, okay. So, when a bee stings you, there are at least five different pheromones that are used to tag you at that moment. Okay, the most important of them from our standpoint is isobutyl acetate bananas. Now let's, let's start by dispelling a myth. You will hear it all over the place that beekeepers can't eat bananas. Wrong. You can, you can peel a banana and stick it in your veil. Bees couldn't care less. It's not close enough. But if you have ever been stung by a bee on the lip, and trust me I have, your whole world smells like banana. Isobutyl acetate was first isolated in the 1850s, and it was the hit of the Crystal Palace exhibition. It was a wonderful, fragrant, light, fruity smell, and we have been using it in cosmetics and soaps and perfumes and whatever ever since. It gives a light floral note to the development of perfumes and all that, and that is why Bees are attracted sometimes to some perfumes and colognes and such is because somewhere in their makeup to, to round out and give the right note, isobutyl acetate was used. Isobutyl acetate, it turns out, is not the sting here tag. We thought it was up until very recently. Um, gas chromatography came into existence around 1958. We'd known for a long time that there was something in bee stingers that caused other bees to come to the site of the sting and attack. All right? And so they made a slurry of bee stingers, 
They put it in a, in 1962, some Canadian uh, researchers put it into a gas chromatograph and they got this big spike and that big spike was, I keep forgetting the name of it, isotope, uh, 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 sorry, isobutyl acetate. And so it's like, oh, that's sting pheromone. Okay, until very recently, as we keep getting more sophisticated, only recently we find out that actually that is an alert pheromone. It calls bees over and tells them to await further orders, basically. It attracts bees to the site. There is a separate, much less strong chemical that will, is actually the tag for sting here. But since it all gets stuck in there at the same time, that's really not, no importance to you. What you need to know is that if you get stung by one bee, uh, you're liable to get stung by a whole lot more bees. What do you do? Step one, keep walking. Step two, get that stinger scraped out while you're going along. Step three, well, if you were a beekeeper and you had your smoker lit, all you do is you smoke the spot so that you build up you know, a smoky scent there and you just go on about your business and you don't think about it anymore because it's okay. You guys aren't going to have lit smokers. So the first thing you should do is get an alcohol wipe and wipe it so that you thin out all that. If you happen to have some bug spray in your pocket, spray it with some bug spray uh, to just break down that scent. Okay. But the most important thing to do is keep moving. If you get stung here, you don't stand there and going, hey, what was the idea behind that? No, by then you should be 15 feet on down the trail. You don't have to run but you should keep moving, okay? Now, another thing about bees, regular European honeybees versus the Africanized bees. Regular European honeybees, rarely, if I am this close to a European beehive and I'm looking at the entrance right there, they are going to pay no attention to me whatsoever. If I am back there past the end of those three, those seats, and I'm looking at an Africanized hive, one of those bees is liable to go, what do you think you're looking at? And just shoot right over there, 30 feet away, and pop me. So the fact that you can't hear bees buzzing doesn't necessarily mean that you're okay. Africanized honeybees are much more defensive that way. And they will chase you much further. If I were to go up to a European honeybee hive and give it a good swift kick, and they came out and started chasing me, they'll usually chase you like 30, 40 feet and then quit. Africanized honeybees can easily chase you a quarter of a mile or more. And they sting you a whole lot more. They give a much higher percentage of their worker force over to guard bee and soldier type uh, conditions than regular honeybees do. So, yeah, a whole lot more of them will come pouring out. So you need to be moving along down the road. Now, on the bright side, the killer bees, the killer Africanized bees and all that really aren't, not anymore in particular. Here in South Florida, all of the bees in my backyard are Africanized. And I work them in shorts, flip-flops, and a T-shirt and a veil. All right? And I don't get stung very often. And everybody I know works their scuts the same way. Scut means scutellara. Uh, Apis mellifera. Mellifera is your European honeybee. Apis mellifera scutellata is the Africanized honeybee. At this point, we no longer say Africanized honeybee. We say Afri African-derived honeybee. They're African. There's you know, no two ways about it. But they are getting gentler and gentler and gentler at least here in this environment, because if I have a hive that's too hot, I break it down, find the queen, pinch her, and say, try again, and let them build themselves a new queen. If I don't like her any better, we'll do it again. But uh, we'll come up with bees that are gentle. And everybody has seen in the course of the last five or six years how much the bees have calmed down, at least within the urban environs. 
I can't really predict what some of the bees that are out there in the Everglades might do. And if somebody says, well, I don't think I've ever seen any bees out in the Everglades. Well, the bee is called the white man's fly. Of course, you know, we do understand uh, uh, European honeybees are an invasive species, right? You know, they don't, they, we brought them here. And the Indians know that if they start seeing bees in the forest, that it's time to move because the neighborhood has gone to crap. Because where you find bees, a few, year, a few miles back, you're going to find settlers. The bees are always out front of the settlers because, you know, they move a couple of miles at a time and stay stepping up ahead and stepping up ahead. So first, you know, as soon as you start seeing bees, it's like, okay, we may not have seen them yet, but there's settlers within two days' walk of here. And so we might want to think about relocating because there goes the neighborhood. Uh, the same, I'm sure, is true true out there because again the bees will perfectly are perfectly content to just have a hive on a branch they're not necessarily they're always going to first choice is always going to be a nice cavity in a tree but if there aren't enough cavities they'll do it on a branch and banyan trees ficus trees of all species like i said i've seen four and five hives in a single tree they have nothing to do with each other they're just all there because there's more than enough space for them all there. And things are so abundant down here that for the most part, it works. Now, abundant um, is a word I want to talk about a little bit too. Right now, we are in what's called dearth. Okay? A swarm that comes out of a hive right now, and they can. If you were some other part of the country, and you were to talk about a swarm in October... They look at you like you had three heads. Swarm season is April, May, or May, June. There's an old saying. A uh, swarm in May is worth a cart of hay. A swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. A swarm in July ain't worth a fly. Because a swarm in July has no chance of surviving. Because by then, midsummer. The nectar flows are over. Everything is setting seed. Everything is growing its seed for harvest in the fall. Yes, there's plenty of pretty flowers down here. And those pretty flowers, some of them even produce some protein for the bees in the form of pollen, but they don't produce much nectar. Things are a little on the thin side down here, and that's why bees kind of get a little defensive. But that's also why a lot of late swarms don't make it they die off they die from hunger and it can be quite amazing i'm a quick story uh the uh broward beekeepers association has taken over three micro apiaries in three of the county parks and you know we're putting members hives in those uh apiaries so people can come and look through the windows and see bees doing their thing and we come out and give programs and such and one of our members put his hives in the one at the north end of the county and he put a uh, some drawn comb super on top and in less than three weeks the bees had completely drawn out that whole uh 10 frame deep that's 90 pounds of honey and drawn out that complete 10 frame deep so see that's what three and a half gallons of honey if you want to put it that way and he thought well okay he took that honey took it home harvested it, took the what we call wet combs, put them back in the box, put them back on the hive so they could clean them up and refill them. And then he went off on a three-week vacation. He came back, and all of his bees were dead. They'd all starved to death. When he put the hives in there, all of the uh, yellow poinciana trees in that park were in bloom. And they had just scarped it down and, and great. But by the time he came back, that bloom was finished, and there was nothing else blooming enough to provide food. They went through what stores they had, and they did have stores in the two bottom boxes. They went completely through those stores. They went through all of the nectar that had been left in the top one. The hive next to it did the same thing. He came back, and he had nothing but dead bees from starvation and just absolutely dry comb. It can happen that quickly down here. And these were strong, strong colonies. Almost too strong. Because uh, when bees get big enough, they get more defensive. Swarms 
are safe because they have nothing to protect. Young colonies are safe and gentle because they have insufficient resources to protect to worry about it. When a colony of bees gets a lot of resources, they've got a lot of pollen, they've, which is bee bread, when they've got a lot of honey stored away, when they've got lots of brood, they can get really defensive. The nicest hives around can start get really testy because they don't want you back there. And that's what it's like right now for all beekeepers down here. If you don't give them a little something to eat, a little extra feed, they can get really testy this time of year. So mm -hmm. just keep in mind, it's midsummer, it's the rainy season, that's part of the problem is we still have things that the bees enjoy and they're still in bloom. Firebush, for instance. Loquat trees, they give you three crops a year. My loquat tree is making its third bloom right now and the bees are all over it. There's all kinds of things that are still here but it's not enough to support a heavy population. So you want to kind of get out of that. Uh, we've gone through that, we've gone through that. Attract the interest of a bee. Okay, yeah. A little bit more on that. If you do attract a guard bee's interest, uh, step one, keep moving. Yes, sir. Just get out of the way. Step two, don't do this. If you do this, you just guaranteed yourself you're going to get stung. Okay, you can, you do this very slowly. It's like, okay, I'm moving, I'm moving. Or better yet, if you can reach out and break a twig off, you take the twig and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, and just use the twig to kind of brush it off. If they're showing a little more interest, well, every beekeeper tries to keep an overgrown part of his backyard because if you kind of stick your head into the bushes and let the leaves slap you in the face as you're walking by, guarantee that'll take care of most guard bees. They'll just back off and leave you alone then. Sticking your head in the bushes is a tried and true method of getting, of getting a guard bee to lose their interest in you. The only exception to that is sometimes if the guard bees are Africanized, I, yeah, this is, that's about the right distance. From about the back of those chairs to about where I am, here is about three feet outside of my apiary. And I'm standing here one day and I'm like looking at the bees, I'm looking at the entrances, I want to see how everybody's doing. And I watched this bee launch themselves off the entrance of hive number two and make a, yes, bee line straight for me, popped me right here. There was no, hey, 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 no. Straight from the front entrance, popped me right here. I smelled nothing but bananas for the next 20 minutes. Okay, and the next day that hive got broken down. I found that queen and I squashed her. <laughs> it was like, no. Try again next lifetime. Okay, so again, and that's because you have to keep this in mind. Bees' main natural enemy is the bear. Bees can't sting a bear anywhere except the face and ears. Bees are attracted to carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, I forgot that part. If you have a, a guard bee that's checking you out too much, as you start walking away, hold your breath. Just stop breathing. I mean, for five paces, just you know, just stop breathing. Carbon dioxide is very attractive to bees. So if you just stop breathing for a second, that'll often, that's enough a lot of times. I'll be working, and it'll be right here, and I'll just stop breathing for a second. And it's like, oh, well, where, where'd he go? And they just fly away. It's like, individually, bees aren't the brightest things. In group, they've got as many, as a hive, they've got as many neurons as a human brain. And the neurons they do have in those little skulls of theirs are some of the most densely packed in nature. Keep that in mind. Bees have had 8 million years to adapt. That's actually kind of sequaying us into the next part of this talk. Yep. Actually, good. I'm done with that, and that segue is perfect. Uh, you, we don't need to save the bees, folks. It's okay. They're going to be fine. Save the bees, save the bees, colony collapse disorder, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. We had colony collapse disorder. And guess what? If you look in the records and you start going into Europe and you start looking at the records, bees have go through what we are now calling colony collapse every 40 to 60 years when 
loads of introduced pathogens get to be too much for them, the colonies all collapse. But here's the cool thing, and it is unique in nature. A queen bee mates with anywhere from 14 to 20 males in one flight most of the time. I mean, there's been a few instances where people have actually observed a queen going out for a second day's mating because I guess she didn't feel sufficiently mated the day before. But most of the time, bees mate with anywhere from 14 to 20 males. And well, she, in her spermatheca, is carrying the sperm of all those different baby daddies. And each one of those lines, and none of them are going to be her line, by the way, you know, a, a queen bee is not chased by drones from her own colony. There's mechanisms for this we don't need to get into, but you get all of these different bees. So all the bees in a colony are either sisters or half-sisters. You know, either sister from the same mister or you, you're just uh, half-sisters with the other ones. And they have all these different genetic traits they have all these different conditioned behaviors, okay? I often talk about a good bee has a template for making comb, and for every piece of comb they make, they just engineer in a queen cup. Now, it may be in the third story of a honey super, but with they, I use mostly drawn comb. I let them draw out their own comb. I don't use foundation for the most part. I did a few experiments with it this last year, and I won't repeat them. I'm going back to just using, let them draw their own comb. Uh, it's cost me a lot of honey. It costs seven times what would, to make a pound of beeswax takes what it would make to make seven pounds of honey. So it costs an awful lot of honey production to make more comb. But, you know, I just let them make their own comb. Uh, but the bees will just engineer in one queen cup per comb. They've never Queen's never going to be there. They're way up here in the honey supers, but they're still going to engineer them in. The ones that don't engineer them in, hmm, I think twice about them sometimes. They're usually the ones who give you a wonky comb all over the place. You get a nice, straight, clean uh, frame of comb, you're probably going to have a nice... Uh, you know, queen cup in there somewhere. It's pretty funny that they do that. But uh, bees have so many traits. I mean, they've gone through 8 million years of volcanoes and earthquakes and tidal waves and floods and fires and this pathogen and that pathogen and the other pathogen. And they keep making it. And if we will leave them alone, they will make it. Bees don't need saving. Beekeepers need saving. Before around 1930, a big bee producer would be someone who had 200 hives in about five or six different out parcels, about 40 uh, hives per location with about three to four miles between locations. Once we had the automobile, and more specifically the truck, that all changed. All of a sudden now, 200 hives? You're just at the high end of being a hobbyist and just kind of leaning towards being a sideliner. You know, you're not really a professional. Professionals have 1,000 hives, 2,000 hives, 10,000 hives, right? And those hives, unfortunately, are being loaded on big trucks and hauled out to California for the almond uh, production. And so every disease that every bee anywhere in the United States has caught, it's like the first day of school down here. They all bring back all the diseases from everywhere else in the country. And some of those diseases will take you down. And some of them won't. But if you leave the bees alone, they'll take care of it. But we have been breeding the bees against this. For instance, beekeepers don't like all that messy, gluey propolis in their hives. So they have been methodically breeding bees that don't make much propolis. Well. My bees are all scuts. In other words, scoot a lot of mutts. Scuts. Uh, they make massive amounts of propolis. You can't do anything in the hives without 
a lot of scraping around first to get things moving. But you know what? What's been found out is that that propolis envelope that bees make is their first line of defense against all diseases and pathogens. And it is, there literally is the first part of their immune system. So when you breed the bees to not make propolis, you're breeding out their first line of defense, okay? And, well, nobody likes swarmy bees, right? Nobody likes to have half of your workforce take off and go somewhere else, you know, so that you're not going to make any honey production from this colony this year. Nobody likes swarmy bees. You select for bees that don't have swarming tendencies. Well, bees' last line of defense, their last ditch effort to survive is to leave. It's to swarm. We just can't make it here. It, when, at, at this point, they are abandoning their brood. They're like, if the colony is going to survive, and this is a superorganism, remember, if this colony is going to survive, this is the most drastic measure we can take, but we're going to take it. We're out of here. Two things that beekeepers have been breeding against for 100 years. They want less propolis. They want bees that don't swarm. Is it any wonder? Bees will fix everything if you just give them a chance. But these people who are on the chemical treadmill, I want to give you an example here. The tracheal mite. Prior to the introduction of the varroa mite, does everybody here heard of the varroa mite? Okay, how about an insect, a mite, whose name is varroa destructor? Can you get any clearer than that? The varroa mite is a really vicious little booger. They bred in Southeast Asia alongside Apis serrana. Okay, Apis mellifera is the western honeybee, Apis serrana is the eastern honeybee. The varroa mite has lived in harmony, if you want to call it that, with Apis serrana for thousands of years. Uh, they're adapted to each other, we'll put it that way. But the Apis serrana does not make a third the honey that Apis mellifera does. So, hey, we're going to bring Western European honeybees to Asia where they've got all this great flowers and they're, under being, they're being underutilized by this wimpy bee. Okay, great. And, of course, the Apis, rather, the uh, Varroa destructor moved in, got on them. But that's not enough. Some people decided, oh, I'm going to bring my honeybees back. Trans-Siberian Trans -Siberian Railroad. They brought them back. They brought them into Eastern Europe. And next thing you know, the Varroa mite has spread across Europe. Then it got into the Americas, back into Africa. Of course, it didn't have to worry about being in Asia. It was already there. The only place that didn't have it was Australia until June of this year. They finally broke the barrier. They have been keeping them out, but greed is an ugly thing. And somebody is always going to flout the law to their own profit, and somebody managed to get a bee in that had the varroa mite on it. They eradicated 20,000 hives around the area where the port that it came in at. Uh, they've given up on that now, and now they're just going to try management the way we have to with the rest of the world. On the bright side, the Australians are brilliant beekeepers. And if anybody can come up with a really good solution for them, it's probably going to be them. But uh, um, I'm, off, I'm off track here slightly. Not really, but slightly. So when the Varroa mite came in, or just prior to the Varroa mite coming in, the biggest problem that beekeepers had to deal with was something called the tracheal mite. And I mean, they had been throwing chemicals at that thing for 20 years. You throw a chemical at it. Now understand, you're throwing a, a, an insecticide at an insect on an insect. You have to be pretty darn careful. You can never get 100% kill. Because if you do, you killed the host too. All right? So the best they can get is like 90%, 95%. 
Well, what happens if you keep killing off 95% of something with a chemical? The 5% that are left become increasingly and increasingly and increasingly resistant to it. So chemical after chemical after chemical became a complete failure on the tracheal mite. But the commercial beekeepers, because this is their business model, they have got to have those colonies there. The colonies have to live. They have to satisfy their contracts for pollination. They have to make that honey. They've got to keep going. They've got to stay on this chemical treadmill. They keep got to keep coming up with new chemicals and throwing at them, which are at the same time being infused into the wax, which is making the bees sicker and sicker at the same time, and blah, blah, blah. Well, Varroa came in, and we got colony collapse. And when we came out of colony collapse and we started treating Varroa mites the same way we used to treat tracheal mites, wait a minute, whatever happened to the tracheal mites? Hmm. After colony collapse, after most of the colonies died, the colonies that survived, one of the things they did was they handled the tracheal mite because nobody was actually treating for it anymore. We don't have a tracheal mite problem anymore. You get the idea here? Some countries said, do not treat. We will subsidize you, let your apiaries collapse, breed from your resistant stock, bring them back up. This is not some, oh, this could take 20 years process. Let me tell you, beekeepers are incredibly smart and creative people. If somebody has 200 colonies and you had colony collapse, you're usually left with between 20 and 40 colonies. Of those colonies, you take the five or six best, strongest colonies that survived the collapse. And it's, it's an easy thing to mark. You had 200 colonies going into winter, you had your winter, you came into spring, and you had 20 colonies alive. Well, you take the five strongest, best, most vigorous of those, and you start making queens from those. You use the other 15 colonies to provide frames of brood to go along with the queens you're putting in here, and you start splitting, and you start feeding, and you make them build up quick, and you start splitting and such, and you can easily come back to that 200 colonies at full strength by fall, to let them come through that winter and see what your uh, losses are. And since the varroa is still there, yeah, you're going to still have some losses. You're not going to go down to 20. You're going to have 120 out of 200. And you're going to repeat the process, which is what we've been doing here uh, recently. There's a gentleman right here in Pompano named Sam Comfort who went to work for a man who had a thousand hives and he thought he had 200 out of that thousand colony collapse happen. He hired Sam to come in, clean things up and get him going again. Well, the first thing Sam had to tell him was, you didn't have 200 hives, you had 20 hives. What you, the bees you saw coming in and out, they were just robbing out the stores and those other dead out hives. Man had 20 hives left out of, of a thousand. Well, Sam Comfort took those hives and with a queen breeding and splitting aggressively and splitting aggressively, feeding sugar like it was out of style, boom, boom, boom. By the next spring, that man had a thousand hives to take back up to New York for his pollination contracts. From 20 hives, he got a thousand. That's an extreme example. But can you imagine any other business that could lose 75% of its production resources on a yearly basis and still have a business model at the end of that? We kind of can, but it's not a great one. Now, let's jump over to uh, Puerto Rico for a minute. In Puerto Rico, nobody had the money for treatments. When Varroa came in, which I think was 1992 in Puerto Rico, Varroa came in. There was no money for treatments. They had no option but to let all of the apiaries collapse and start rebuilding. And by the way, they have the African ice bees too, of course. I'll have, pardon me here while I check my dates. We're past Sam Comfort. Yeah. Yep. So far what I said was right. 
But then in 2016, Hurricane Maria came in and took out 80% of the bees. They had built back up. They were in harmony with Varroa, I guess you would say. And then 80% of the hives were destroyed again. And they rebuilt. And Varroa is not a problem. These are Africanized bees. But one of the characteristics of Africanized bees is grooming behavior. European honeybees will groom each other for about eight seconds. And nobody has ever actually seen a Varroa mite be groomed off of a European honeybee during these eight second grooming sessions. Whereas the Africanized bees in Puerto Rico, they will groom for a full minute. Eight seconds versus a minute. They will groom for a full minute and they remove at least 30% of the Varroa mites on the bees. And they don't just remove them and drop them. They actually chew them up. They kill them. At the very least, they chew all the legs off of them. And a lot of times they see them actually crushing them in two, which a lot of people tell you the bees can't crush a Varroa mite with this mandibles, but apparently they can. Because they are grooming them out. They're not needing to use any treatments. They are in balance the same way Apis serrana is in Eastern, or in the, you know, in the Far East, in Asia. But they're just as productive, as I said earlier, but as the African honeybee is more productive in a lot of cases, at least as productive as the European honeybee, which means that you can get two to 300 pounds of honey from a hive in a good situation <coughs> where there's good flows and such. So it doesn't get much better than that. And the nice thing is, the weird thing is, and they haven't figured it out yet why it happened. I have my suspicions, but there's no way to prove them. The Africanized honeybees in Puerto Rico gentled down completely. Completely. They work them like ordinary bees. They have this extreme behavior of cleaning and grooming each other, which takes care of the Varroa. They don't, they're now gentle again. Because, and that's mostly because, for whatever reason, when they got knocked down to 20%, in that 20% were bees that just did not have that real aggressive gene in them, that particular allele. And so they're doing fine. And we're hoping sometime soon <clears throat> to be able to get some of those bees down here. Now, the state of Florida, like most states, is locked into Monsanto and Bayer and all these other big corporations which are putting all this money into their campaigns and all this other stuff. And so we are locked into, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you have to be treating with all this stuff, blah, 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 blah. As a license, that is reg I'm sorry, registered with the state, I'm supposed to be doing it too. I don't. I'm treatment free. It doesn't mean I don't do things to help my bees handle varroa loads. I will stop a queen from laying for a week at a time so that there are fewer broods because that's where varroas get. Anybody interested in varroa at all? They have the coolest system. You wonder why we can't get rid of them? Let me explain this to you. The uh, female is called the foundress. And she can be deposited on a flower by another bee. She can just hop off and be on the flower, wait for another bee to come along, hop on the bee, fly back to the hive, hop off the bee, and wander around. The bees pay no attention to them. Just like they don't pay attention to a lot of other insects. When she smells a uh, pupae that is about, I'm sorry, not pupae, a larvae that is about ready to be capped over to become becoming a pupae, they will slip in to the cell in the last couple of minutes before it gets capped. And then they will attach themselves to that larvae, which is going to be coming a pupae, and they will start sucking, usually about six hours after the cell is capped. If they do it too soon after, they'll take the cap off and they'll pull them out. But they'll get in there, they'll tap into it. She'll start sucking. Then the first thing she will do is lay a male egg. And when that egg hatches, and it starts sucking too, she will then lay a female egg. And if the conditions are right, she'll lay a second 
And if she is in a drone cell, which is what they prefer, sometimes she can even lay a third. That really doesn't happen with Africanized bees too much because the uh, life cycle, which is normally considered to be 21 days, we can complete that life cycle in 19 days down here. That's one of the beauties of Af the Africanized bees is that we can complete that life cycle so much sooner that they don't have a chance to lay as many eggs. But then when the cell is open, the bee emerges, the foundress hops off and goes and repeats the process. Her female offspring hop off and go repeat the process. The male dies, who cares about him? They're, but talk about genetics, it's amazing. Bees are fascinating creatures. You can study them for 50 years and you'll learn something new every day. And I've gone down many a rabbit hole because things are just fascinating. Let me see if there's anything I've left out that I meant to mention. Oh, yes, one thing. Uh, okay. Am I out of time? Oh, good. That's working. No, well, sorry. I may not get enough questions in. Uh, if you want to read one book on beekeeping, I would strongly recommend Dr. Tom Seeley, The Lives of Bees, and secondarily, Honeybee Democracy. Uh, the Lives of Bees is a life of bees in the wild. Now, it's in New York State. Things are a little bit faster down here, but I wonder, he came to the conclusion, he's 40 years as a entomologist and bee researchers, researcher, and he is now proposing that we uh, use Darwinian beekeeping, which is exactly what I've just been describing. Let the bees do it. They're a lot smarter than we are, and they can handle their own stuff. But I want to read you this one quote from him, and we'll end with that. If you let an animal live naturally, it is able to use its full toolbox and skill sets to survive and reproduce. But when you take any kind of animal and you force it to live in a different way, those tools are not allowed to function very well. So it's, that's honeybees. We've been breeding them for our benefit not theirs. Who knows how many traits we may have lost in this process over the last two centuries or so, but mostly since around the 1930s. Uh, 1930s, we mostly were just dealing with the German black bee in most of America. Then they started bringing in the uh, 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 Italian honey bee and crossbreeding with them. But that never worked with the African bees. 200 years, fortunes have been lost trying to bring European honeybees into Africa and gentle the African bees. And it just doesn't work. And the African beekeepers will tell you it's because Italian honeybees work all day long. And the African bees don't work in the heat of the day. The queen stops laying in the heat of the day. So as long as you're trying to force them to work in the heat of the day, you're just going to keep getting failures. We're going to drop that right there and let you guys start asking questions. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, all these pesticides and stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that get into the honey that we buy? No. Oh, no. no. Uh, because honey is hygroscopic, and these pesticides are all uh, fat-soluble. These pesticides get absorbed into the wax, because wax is nothing but a lipid. It's a fat. And so... If, they're, if they have chemicals on them and they touch the wax, they can absorb into the wax, but they don't really absorb into the honey. We shouldn't be getting honey with the comb. If you get honey with the comb in it, you're a little more likely to be getting a product that's closer to real. But I, real is a word I don't tend to use with any store-bought honey. Next. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Does it work to have one? Two. You should always have two hives. And the reason for that is if you only have one hive, you have no idea whether your hive is doing well or not because you have nothing to compare it to. And if you have a, say, the hive has gone queenless for any of the many reasons that a hive could have gone queenless down here. The hive's gone queenless. You've still got plenty of cat brood. You've still got some open brood or maybe not have any open brood. That's one of the first signs your hive's gone queenless is there's no longer any eggs or open brood. It's all cat brood. You come over to your other hive, you get 
a frame of brood that has eggs and open larvae, you put it in that hive, they will make a new queen and you've saved the hive. But if you didn't do that, then you've got a narrow window of opportunity to run around, find a, somebody who's selling queens, or you need to have friends who are beekeepers so that you can go over and beg a frame of brood from them that you can put in there so they can make themselves a new queen. Next. Yes, sir. If you can start two kinds of mites, are they external? Uh, yes. Well, external, yes. They, the phoretic, the uh, varroa mite, the phoretic stage of the varroa mite is attached to the bee on the thorax. How do you control the bee? It doesn't kill the bee. The uh, large number of viruses that the mite vectors is what usually ends up killing the bee. They weaken the bee up to 30% uh, lacking in strength. But it is the uh, K-wing virus, the uh, deformed wing virus, and uh, 21 different viruses that can be vectored that will end up killing the hive because it weakens them far more than that. The uh, tracheal mite, on the other hand, as the name implies, is internal. It goes in and attaches itself to the trachea from the inside. And so I guess that's what you, your definition of internal versus external. Yeah, they, uh, a varroa mite on a bee is the size of a soccer ball. Slice the soccer ball in half and slap it right here. And that's what a varroa mite looks like on a bee. Um, can you just briefly discuss the different kinds of honey? Like I know there's a true varroa honey and various honey. How do they get Okay, the, uh, the term here is flow. Okay. We don't really have flow down here to speak of. So if you're an area that has a lot of tupelo trees, the tupelo trees bloom in a three week period. If you have a strong colony of honeybees and you put fresh empty comb on the top of that colony as the tupelo start blooming, that's where they're gonna go is to that tupelo and they're gonna bring it in and they're gonna pack that in. And you can get tupelo honey that way. Same way with clover honey, big thing. Uh, sea grape honey. Is there a really big difference in the taste of the honey? There can be a fantastic difference in the taste of the honeys. Sea grape honey, not something I would ever trust. In fact, I'd only tasted it once before. Uh, close to 40 years ago, I used to set up at a flea market. I was a nurseryman. I used to sell some plants on the side on the weekend. The guy who set up next to me was a beekeeper who would sell his honey. And he was, his day job was as a janitor at a nuclear plant. And the man's name was Henry Ford, just as an aside there. Uh, but one year, we, it was 1979, I guess it was, we had a freeze. It knocked all the bloom off of the Brazilian pepper. And so it was possible for, but it didn't knock the bloom off the sea grapes. So it was possible for him to make a super of sea grape honey, which he brought to me, a jug, a gallon jug, with the greatest of excitement, because he would give me honey, I would give him mead. And he says, I want mead made from this honey. And let me tell you, it was good. <laughs> Hadn't seen it again until Sanibel Island. Fascinating. On one side, on the uh, Gulf side of the island, the sea grape trees had bloomed, set their fruit, the green fruit had full grown full size and were starting to turn purple. They were starting to ripen. At the main drag down through the middle of Sanibel Island, the sea grapes there had just finished blooming and you know the, the grapes were little tiny things like this. On the gulf side or the bay side of the main road, the flowers were just starting to wilt. And we drop our kayaks in and we're kayaking through the mangroves and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden we hear nothing but the roar of bees and we go to investigate. And the sea grapes that are in among the islands and the mangroves on the bay side are still all in full bloom. So when we went to the uh, uh, Sanibel Captiva Conservation District headquarters, which is what they call their nursery there, uh, and they had sea grape honey for sale. That was the first time I've ever trusted it and bought sea grape honey. 
and it really was, and it was good. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I had a different question. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I know a YouTuber who told me a story about a woman whose daughter in Florida was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Yes, that would be Sherry. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, you know the story. Oh, yeah, I know Sherry. In fact, Everybody but me is at her clubhouse right now. <laughs> so what, what's interesting me is that I have had Lyme disease, so I mm -hmm. found it particularly interesting that the 5,000 yeast thing was cured. And, and it saved her life completely, and that has been repeated hundreds of times. Are there other applications that can be done? Absolutely. Uh, like I said, it's a cortisone response, a cortisol response. I will, I keep a bare earth under my hives so I can see dying bees on the ground. Bees don't like to die in the hive. They like to leave the hive. If they can't fly anymore, they'll flop to the ground, but they'll crawl around the ground for a while. So I'll take a big pair of tweezers out. I'll grab a bee and I'll stick him on my knee and let him sting me right about here. And uh, I'll hang around for a couple of minutes. Remember what I said about response? A couple of more bees will come over and sting me there, and then I'll go, thanks, guys, that's enough, and I'll boogie out of there. But a few stings on the knee certainly uh, makes me a lot sprier. Uh, but, yes, there's all kinds of things that can be done. Apotherapy is not exactly legal, not exactly illegal, but a lot of people don't want – a lot of doctors don't want to admit that they do it, for that matter. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. It's all the same. They're poison contents. Actually, there's some people who've said that the African bee has slightly less. Oh, yeah, there's a fun fact that we should throw in here. It takes about a thousand bee stings to kill a 200 pound male or one if you actually are allergic. But for a normal healthy male who is not allergic to bees, it takes about a thousand to do it. Now, don't think about the math here too much. Uh, but it's about 40 bees per pound. Okay, now the two don't add up, that's 800. But that is, if you're going to figure out, you've got a 30-pound dog who's been stung, so 30 times 40 bees, you know, 1,200 bees, you're kind of in the, or 120 bees, rather, you're kind of in the right range there. So it'll give you some idea of you know, the weight and such. So not too many people actually ever get killed. But if you were doing Arizona Africanized bees, you probably would be. They double tape everything. Um, you know, they put on two suits, they tape their gloves on, they tape the boots on, and they come back prickling with them so much. You throw those suits in the wash, you don't wash anything else with them because when they come out of the wash, any other clothes could still have so much bee venom in them that a sensitive person could react to it. That's how, that's how extreme it can be. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't seem to be. Oh, we all keep African bees. Uh, every time I've tried to buy cultured bees, I put them in the hive. The bees go, hmm. By the time they have laid up a area of comb about like this, right, they'll already be starting a supersedure cell, which means we don't like her. We don't like the smell of her. We don't like the taste of her, whatever. We want our own queens. And so as soon as possible, they will start a supersedure cell so they can get a queen that'll come out, go out and get mated and come back, and they'll like the taste of her better or the smell of her better. I've, I've bought, I mean, they keep, they order us, they force us, they want us to put these civilized bees in down here. It doesn't work. Our bees don't like them. Oh, well, yeah, whatever. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm sorry? I was actually pointing to the guy in blue, but go ahead. So what are the things you do to remove the flies? Or? Me, not so much. I, uh, I would take down a uh, swarm here and there when I want the bees. Understand, a lot of us will do that because there's nothing better than bees that have survived in nature and have never been treated. If we can get that hive and get it into our box, we're ahead of the game in terms of the genetics. We get a lot more diversity that way. Uh, there are professionals down here, the Professionals Bee Club. These are people who carry the insurance for this. 
See, if I do it, I don't charge because if I charge, then I'm liable. Right. You as a homeowner are liable on your insurance if I screw up because I'm just taking the bees because I want them. But let's touch on that for just a second, shall we? Uh, but I want, why do you mean you want to charge me to remove these bees? I'm giving you free bees. Appreciate it. Best way to make a million dollars beekeeping is to start with $2 million. If I come in and I get those bees, just the frames they go in are going for about $3 a piece. The box, by the time you put these bees in a bee box, you've invested $300 cold hard cash in the physical equipment necessary to save this hive of bees. That is, you've got your frames, you go out there, you cut them all out, hot, sweaty work, for which you need a suit, which costs you about $300. You know, you get them all banded in and everything else, you put them in there, you come back, you feed them, you feed them, you feed them, you get them brought up, they're working now. Okay, good, you've got a new hive, but I could go out and buy a hive of bees for $250. I've got more than that into saving these bees for you for free. That's not a sustainable business model, folks. <laughs> it only works if it's your hobby, like it's mine. I don't care because, actually, if I was going to sell my honey, my honey probably, if you were to actually take the money that I have invested in this hobby and divide that by pounds, my honey would probably go in for about $35 a pound. <laughs> and nobody's going to pay that for it. So, anything else? I should say, my wife says I should say goodbye. So, okay, everybody, I guess we're done. <laughs>